Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face before, then hi, I'm Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the solved case of Rachel Moran, a young woman who just suddenly disappeared while she was walking home on New Year's Day. The search for Rachel was huge. The police were doing absolutely everything they could to try and find her. But then about a month into the search, this missing persons investigation turned into a murder inquiry. I did actually read a book about this case during my research. It's called The Murder of Rachel and it was written by Rachel's mother. It's of course a really sad read but it's also very very informative and really well written so if any of you would like to read this book I will leave it linked in the description box along with the other sources that I used to research this case. So for today's case we are going all the way back to the year 2003 in Hull which is a city in East Yorkshire in England and this is 21 year old Rachel Louise Moran. Her story begins on the 17th of January 1981, which is the day that she was born. Rachel's parents were called Ray and Wanda Moran, and they had four children in total. There were three girls and one boy in the Moran family. There was Kerry, who was the oldest, then Vanda, then there was John, and then finally Rachel. Rachel was quite a bit younger than her other siblings, actually. When she was born, her two sisters were 17 and 11, although there was a slightly smaller age gap between her and her brother. John was six when Wanda gave birth to Rachel so she was really like the baby of the family. Rachel was actually born in Ireland however when she was around six months old the family of six moved to Hull in England and from what I can gather the Moran children all had a good upbringing. Ray and Wanda were very caring and loving parents. They were always very protective of their children especially with Rachel just because she was the youngest. Rachel always did well in school growing up. Her parents always received excellent school reports from her teachers. She always had a lot of friends and she had a real passion for music and dancing, particularly ballet. She was really good at ballet. Rachel was described as being a home bird. She wasn't the kind of person that really had big dreams of traveling. She just liked being at home for the most part, being close to her family. She was also very bubbly and carefree. She was just a happy-go-lucky young woman. During her teenage years, she went to Hull College where she did a course in IT. She also got a job in a hotel at one point and then eventually she started a new course at college, which was a cabaret course, I believe, which sounds really cool. And it was while she was on this course that she met a boy named Mark who enrolled on the course the year after Rachel. Mark was about a year and a half younger than Rachel but they got along really really well and eventually they began dating and they moved in together in a flat on the Orchard Park estate in Hull which was not far at all from Rachel's parents house. It was less than a mile away so she would still see them very often and it was around this time that she got a job as a cake decorator, which she really enjoyed. However, I think her main ambition, well, her dream career was to one day be a chef. She really enjoyed cooking and that was what she wanted to do with her life. And so by the end of 2002, she decided that she was going to go back to college again the following year in 2003, and she was going to enroll onto a catering course. But Rachel would never get the opportunity to start making her dream career a reality because she disappeared before the course even began, before the new year of 2003 even really began. Just a couple of weeks before the new year in late 2003, 2002, Rachel and her boyfriend Mark had actually purchased two kittens that they called Speedy Tomato and Batman, which is so cute. But yeah, they bought some kittens as they wanted some pets in their home and Rachel's mother Wanda says that Rachel 
literally treated these kittens as if they were her children. She absolutely adored them and she was very dedicated to looking after them. Rachel didn't really ever want to leave the kittens on their own in their home because they were babies so she wanted someone to be with them and watch over them at all times whilst they were still young. And so Rachel and Mark came up with a plan to ensure that the kittens were well looked after over the Christmas and New Year's period. You see Mark would usually go and stay with his family over the Christmas break and I don't believe they lived very close I think they lived on the other side of Hull so he would normally go and stay with his family at Christmas time and Rachel would stay with hers so the young couple decided that over Christmas whilst Mark was with his family Rachel would look after the kittens on her own and then on New Year's Eve of 2002 Mark would stay home and be with the kittens whilst Rachel went out with her brother John and their mother Wanda was so happy that John and Rachel were going out together I don't think they usually spend too much time together because of course they were both adults now they both had their own separate lives and they didn't live together anymore so it was nice that they were going to spend new year's together and so on the evening of the 31st of december 2002 john and his younger sister rachel headed out to the pub they met up with friends rachel even made a couple of new friends that night they had a couple of drinks and then about an hour after the midnight countdown to new year they decided to head back to their parents home where they were both going to be sleeping that night rachel and john arrived home at around 1 20 a.m and john pretty much went straight to bed because he had had quite a lot to drink that night whereas rachel hadn't drunk that much at all she had had a couple of lagers but that was it really and so she stayed up with her mother the two of them chatted for a little while and then rachel decided to go to bed but before she did she picked up the phone and she gave her boyfriend Mark a call just to wish him a happy new year and check that he and the kittens were okay so she rang their home phone but Mark didn't pick up and so she went to call his mobile phone and when she did one of Mark's friends answered and Rachel could hear like music and people in the background it sounded like Mark was out at a party which he was when she spoke to him on the phone Mark told Rachel that after she had left to go out with her brother John that night, a couple of friends had contacted him and asked if he wanted to come along to a New Year's party that was happening rather last minute and Mark agreed. However, this seemed to really upset and annoy Rachel because as we talked about earlier, the plan was for Mark to stay at home that night and look after the kittens and Rachel would go out. Rachel wasn't very happy about the kittens being left on their own overnight and so she headed up to her bedroom she changed into some new clothes she put on her trainers and she opened the front door and shouted goodbye to her mum she was going to walk back to her flat to be with the kittens however as soon as Wanda heard Rachel shout she jumped straight up and she ran out the door after her daughter Wanda of course wasn't happy about Rachel walking home on her own in the early hours of the morning because it was cold and it was dark and so she pleaded with Rachel not to go but Rachel was quite insistent. Wanda considered driving Rachel home but she had had a couple of drinks that night as it was New Year's so she couldn't and she even thought about asking this stranger, this man that was walking past if he wouldn't mind walking Rachel back to her flat. But Rachel just kept saying I'll be fine mum it's not far and it soon became clear to Wanda that nothing, no amount of pleading with Rachel was going to stop her from walking back home and so she just said okay but please make sure that you bring me when you get back and Rachel agreed. So Rachel left, she began the short journey to her flat on Orchard Park Estate however Wanda never received that phone call from her daughter and despite Rachel's flat being less than a mile away from her parents home she never made it there. After about half 
half an hour, Wanda was still waiting for that phone call, but of course it never came. And so she began trying to ring Rachel, but Rachel just wasn't answering the phone. It would just ring and ring and ring and no one would pick up. And so Wanda began ringing Rachel's house phone, but again, there was no answer. And of course, Wanda started worrying straight away. She just could not understand why Rachel was not answering the phone and why she hadn't gotten into contact because she would have known that her mother would have been waiting for that call. Wanda began thinking that maybe instead of going straight back home, Rachel had actually gone out to find her boyfriend Mark and that's why she wasn't picking up. But regardless, she kept ringing Rachel's phone just hoping that she would eventually pick up but she didn't. Every single call just went to voicemail. Wanda continued ringing for hours until it got to around 4.30 in the morning and by this time she just decided to go to bed because she didn't really know what else to do. Rachel clearly wasn't home because she wasn't answering the house phone and she couldn't just drive around looking for her because she had had a couple of drinks and she couldn't get her husband Ray or her son John to go out and look for her because they had also been drinking that night. And she wouldn't even know where to look anyway. If Rachel had gone to meet Mark, she didn't know where the two would be by now and she was absolutely exhausted. She had been up all night and so reluctantly Wanda decided to just go to bed and she hoped that she would hear from Rachel in the morning. Wanda woke up at around 10 a.m the following morning and the sound of her husband Ray on the phone made her jump out of bed and run downstairs. She was hoping that he was speaking to Rachel but it turns out that he was talking to one of their other daughters Vanda and this just made Wanda panic even more. It was hours and hours was later now and still there was no contact from Rachel and this was very out of character for her and when Wanda told the rest of the family about what had happened the previous night they also grew very concerned and everyone just started trying to contact Rachel to make sure that she was okay. They all began texting and calling her mobile phone and the house phone but to no avail. However eventually someone did pick up their home phone but it wasn't Rachel, it was her boyfriend, Mark. And when they asked if Rachel was there, Mark seemed confused. He said, no, she's home with you, isn't she? I thought she was staying at yours last night. Mark told the family that he had been at the New Year's party with his friends all night, and that when he returned home to his and Rachel's flat at around 7 a.m., he was the only one there, and it didn't seem like Rachel had returned. The flat was exactly how he'd left it, Rachel's belongings that she had with her that night were not there, the kittens hadn't been fed and the bed hadn't been slept in so it appeared as though Rachel never arrived back the previous evening. The Moran family started ringing around other relatives and Rachel's friends to see if any of them had heard from her but no one had and so Ray and Wanda Moran decided that it was time to go to the police station and report Rachel as a missing person. The police took a statement from Rachel's family about what happened the night before. They went to her flat just to check it out and the search quickly began for Rachel Moran. And despite the fact that Rachel was almost 22 years old, she was an adult, this report was taken very seriously by the police because of just how unlike Rachel this was. Pretty soon into the investigation, the police were able to almost rule out completely the theory that maybe Maybe Rachel had just decided to disappear. She decided to run away and start a new life somewhere else. After looking more into her background, they just could not identify any reason as to why she would have wanted to do that. She had a happy life. She had a good family, a good relationship. She had just purchased two kittens and she was looking forward to starting her catering course. So why would she want to start a new life somewhere else? Over 40 officers were assigned to this case. And of course, as police do with the majority of missing persons cases, they started their investigation by looking more into the people that were closest to Rachel. So her friends and family, just in 
case they might have had anything to do with whatever had happened to her. They interviewed pretty much every single person that Rachel knew, particularly her mother Wanda. She was interviewed at length because it seemed as though she was the last person to see Rachel alive the previous night. So they really needed as much detail from Wanda as possible. And she ran the detectives through her timeline of events. She told them about the fact that she had begged Rachel not to walk home on her own, but that Rachel was insistent on doing just that. And she also told the police about a passerby that she saw that night. If you recall from earlier on in the video, when Rachel and Wanda were talking outside of the house, Wanda saw a man walking by and she contemplated asking him if he could walk her daughter home, even though he was a stranger. But she didn't ask him and he just carried on walking in the same direction that Rachel would walk just minutes later. So the police knew that they needed to try and track down this passerby because he was a potential witness. Maybe he would remember seeing something that night. Maybe he saw Rachel before she disappeared. So Wanda told the police everything she could remember about what this man looked like. She said that she believed he was either bold or he had fair hair and she also thought he was wearing a blue shirt but of course it was the middle of the night so it was dark and she wasn't paying too much attention to this man because he was just walking by so the police knew that her description of him may not have been the most accurate but anyway they began trying to track him down and in the meantime they continued questioning other people in Rachel's life including her boyfriend Mark and I think the detectives were quite suspicious of Mark right from the off because even though it seemed as though on the whole they had a good happy relationship they were made aware of the fact that on the night Rachel went missing she was quite annoyed at him because he had gone out to a party and left the kittens on their own and when she spoke to him on the phone before she left her house they did have a bit of an argument about it. So the police questioned Mark and they noticed that during his interviews he didn't appear too upset about the situation which they thought was quite unusual because obviously his partner was missing. So they did have their concerns that maybe Mark was involved in Rachel's disappearance and they started looking more into his alibi from that night. Obviously he claimed that he was at a New Year's party with friends and he didn't get back to the flat that he shared with Rachel until around 6, 7 a.m. the next morning and eventually when the police spoke to the other people that were at this party they were able to determine that Mark was telling the truth. They could all confirm that he was there all night. And Rachel's family was certain that Mark had nothing to do with it. They knew that he absolutely adored Rachel and that he would never have done anything to hurt her. And despite what the detectives originally thought, he was genuinely heartbroken about the fact that Rachel was missing. So that was Mark ruled out as a suspect, which of course was a good thing, but for the detectives, this meant that they were pretty much back to square one with the investigation. It was proving very difficult because they had nothing, nothing to go on and no trace of Rachel. After looking into Rachel's bank and mobile phone records, they were able to determine that Rachel hadn't used either of those. So she hadn't used her mobile phone at all and her money hadn't been touched, which just further discounted the theory that she had left of her own accord, that she had chosen to disappear because if she had, surely she would have needed money to do so. One of the things that the detectives did early on in the investigation was they decided to have a look through all CCTV footage from cameras that were within a six mile radius of where Rachel was last seen. So they were asking the council to hand over footage from their cameras, they were asking local shops that had CCTV to hand over their footage um, and also homeowners if anyone had cameras outside of their house is the police wanted to see their footage. They wanted to see if they could spot Rachel on any of it. 
and they did. They spotted Rachel walking alone along whole roads on the night that she disappeared. She was walking past a supermarket, I believe, and she was walking in the direction of her flat. So this showed that she did intend to go back home that night. She didn't decide to go somewhere else. She disappeared somewhere on her route home. So from this point on, the police searches were very much focused on this area and around this area where she was spotted on the CCTV footage as this appeared to be the last footage of her before she vanished. They brought in sniffer dogs to see if they could pick up a scent of Rachel. Helicopters were used to scan the area from above. Fields and gardens were being extensively searched. Drains and rivers were being dragged. The police were doing everything they could to find Rachel and get some answers for her family. But as time went on, people's hopes of finding Rachel alive really started to decrease. It had been days and days since her disappearance and still there was no sign of her. But then around two weeks after she went missing, something was found. So like I said, as part of the inquiry, local drains and rivers were being dragged and searched by dive teams. And during a search of one of the local canals, which was about a mile away from Rachel's flat, they found a couple of Rachel's belongings in the water. They found one trainer, which matched the description of the trainers that Rachel was wearing on the night that she disappeared. And then just the next day, they found a woman handbag that had been placed in a bin bag and then dumped in the canal and inside this handbag was a mobile phone various different cosmetic items and an irish passport and when the police opened this passport they realized that it was Rachel Moran's. This was Rachel's handbag that had been dumped in the canal. And it was clear that whoever had dumped it never wanted it to be found. Why else would they put it in a bin bag and then throw it into the canal? So after finding these items, the dive teams continued searching the canal, thinking that if Rachel was dead and if she had been murdered, maybe her killer had also dumped her body in the water as well as her belongings. However, when the rest of the canal was searched, nothing was found. There was no sign of Rachel's body. Following this, the police decided to film a reconstruction of Rachel's last known movements. So they got a female police officer that looked similar to Rachel and was wearing similar clothes. They got her to walk down the same route that she would have taken on the night that she disappeared. This reconstruction was then released to the public as part of an appeal and the police were hopeful that this might result in some new witnesses coming forward with information. Maybe it would jog people's memories and they would remember seeing Rachel that night. And it worked. After this reconstruction was released, several people came forward with potential tips and leads. However, the only problem with this was the fact that the people coming forward were remembering things from the night of New Year's. And of course, the majority of people on New Year's Eve and in to New Year's Day are either drunk or they've at least had a couple of drinks. So the police knew that these people providing tips and leads may not have been the most credible because their memories from that night may be slightly inaccurate because they had consumed alcohol. So whilst it was somewhat helpful that these potential witnesses came forward, the police knew that they couldn't fully trust their account just in case they were drunk that night. However, this reconstruction and this appeal for new information did result in the police obtaining even more CCTV footage from the night that Rachel went missing. This CCTV footage was from a nearby school and it showed a figure which they believed was a woman walking down a road which was just 150 meters away from Rachel Moran's flat. And when the police continued watching this footage, they were able to spot another person 
person walking not too far behind this woman almost like they were following her but unfortunately they couldn't really tell if this person if this second person was a male or a female this footage really isn't very good quality at all i will try and include some pictures but it was obviously the middle of the night so it was dark and rainy and this area where this footage is from wasn't very well lit so it's really hard to see the two figures but yeah the police were able to see two people one which they believed was a female walking in the direction of Rachel Moran's flat so for that reason they believed that this was Rachel and they theorized that the second person the person walking behind her was probably somehow involved in her disappearance since we know Rachel never made it home that night and yet she was so so close to her flat Something must have happened to Rachel within those 150 metres of this CCTV camera and her home. And this person following her probably had something to do with it. If she had been abducted or even murdered, then this second figure may have been the perpetrator. So now that they had this second lot of CCTV footage, the detectives decided that their next port of call was going to be searching every single house, every single single home within a mile and a half radius of the area that this footage had come from because if the person following Rachel on this footage was her killer then that probably means that her body isn't going to be very far it would be very difficult for someone to move her body on their own so they probably hadn't taken it far away if that makes sense so over 100 officers were brought in and they had to literally go to every house knock on the door and ask the occupants if they could come in and search the entire property from top to bottom including any garages and cars in total they had about 300 houses to search and the operation began on tuesday the 28th of january 2003 the 100 officers were split into to like little teams and these teams consisted of two police officers and a search specialist and each group went door to door asking the homeowners and the occupants if they could search their property and to be honest this plan to search all of these homes was a big risk for the detectives because they were going to be spending a lot of money and using a lot of resources on a line of inquiry that may just lead nowhere they might not find anything so they knew that it was a risk but it was one that they were willing to take and in the end it would prove to be the correct course of action because these searches would eventually provide the police with the breakthrough they had been waiting for on the afternoon of the 28th of january so the same day that the house searches began after about a dozen homes had been searched the head of the investigation detective superintendent paul davis Anderson received a phone call from one of the search teams they'd found something this team had been searching properties not too far from rachel's flat and eventually they came across an area called nash court which i believe is a road with houses and flats along it and they were knocking on every door in nash court asking to come in and have a look around and soon enough they came across flat number 19 which was home to a 22 year old man named michael little when they knocked on michael little's door he opened it and he willingly let them in I think he knew why they were there he knew that they were conducting searches for any trace of the missing woman anyway Michael let them in and inside his flat was just him and one of his friends who didn't live there from what I can gather Michael lived at that address on his own and Michael began walking the detectives around his home and they started looking around and conducting their search and although his flat was a bit of a mess Yes, they didn't find anything everything seemed normal just before they were about to leave they decided to quickly check Michael's bin cupboard I believe every flat in that area had like a cupboard where they could put a dustbin or they were just used for extra storage they were about three foot high and they could actually lock people had keys for them so the search team went to have a look inside Michael's bin cupboard but when they tried to open it they realized 
noticed that it was locked. And so they asked Michael if they could have the key for it. But Michael said that he wasn't actually sure where he had put it. He said that he thought it might have been at his mother's house. But of course, the officers couldn't just leave. They had to search everywhere. And this cupboard was the last place they needed to search in Michael's home. So they were quite insistent that they needed that key. And then after a short while, Michael went into another room. He located the key and he handed it over to the officers. So they unlocked the bin cupboard and as you'd expect, they found a pile of rubbish. Quite a big pile of rubbish actually. There were bin bags, carpet scraps, cardboard boxes full of stuff. So the two officers began going through all of it. They were picking up everything that was inside this cupboard and just moving it out of the way so that they could get to the bottom. And when one of the officers went to pick up another bag, he stopped all of a sudden. And the second officer noticed that he had stopped and that his colleague was kind of staring at something inside the cupboard. And so he went towards his colleague and he peered inside the cupboard to see what he was looking at. And when he did, he realised that there was a human leg sticking out from under the pile of rubbish. So they moved some more of this rubbish and there at the bottom of this cupboard they found the dead body of 21 year old Rachel Moran who had been missing for about four weeks. She had been wrapped in a duvet and she was laying in the fetal position in the cupboard and of course the officers were shocked at this discovery and also just completely horrified. This cupboard was pretty small, it wasn't a huge cupboard and Rachel was a tall girl, I think she was over six foot so she had been crammed inside this space. When they first opened the cupboard, the officers did notice that there was a terrible smell coming from it. They likened it to rotting meat. However, initially they probably thought that it was just the smell of the rubbish, but of course it wasn't. It was Rachel's decomposing body. So obviously as soon as they found the body, the officers arrested the two men that were inside that flat, Michael Little and his friend. They were both arrested on suspicion of murder. And both men reacted to this in very different ways. Michael Little kind of remained calm. He didn't have much of a reaction. Whereas his friend, his name was Mark Fuller, he just seemed really confused. He was just like, what? What have you found in the cupboard? He seemed genuinely as shocked as the officers did. But regardless, they were both arrested and the officers at the scene contacted the investigation team and they waited for backup so that the two men could be taken to the police station. Soon enough, the first police car arrived and Michael Little's friend Mark was handcuffed and taken away with one of the officers. And so that left the other officer, PC Dennison, and Michael Little alone in the flat as they were waiting for the second police car. And it was whilst the two men were alone that Michael Little actually started to talk. He kind of made a confession. I think he realised that there was no way he was going to be able to deny this. Rachel's body had literally been found in his cupboard. Denying that he had something to do with whatever had happened would just be pointless and so he started to talk. Whilst Little was talking, the officer was obviously taking notes. He was writing down everything that Little said. So I've got some direct quotes here from Little. He said to PC Dennison, quote, I'm so glad you found her. I've wanted to tell someone for ages. It's such a weight off my chest. I saw the police stuff on the news and I hoped they would come here. I've not told anybody else. Nobody knows. I can't be a normal person doing this. I must be evil or something. I saw her that night walking alone so I went over and spoke to her. She came back here for a drink and we chatted for a while but ended up arguing. I think I walked out of the room or something and when I came back she had gone to the kitchen and was stood at the side with her back to me. When I went near her she turned around and I saw a small knife in her hand. She slept
slashed out at me and cut me on my arm. So I grabbed a knife and just stabbed her. After he made this confession, Michael Little was taken to the police station and news spread very quickly that Rachel Moran's body had been found. And when Rachel's mother Wanda was told the news, she says that she was in a way relieved. Obviously this was not the outcome that she was hoping for. She was praying that Rachel would be found alive, but I think she knew deep down that that wasn't going to be the case. She knew that Rachel was probably dead. And when she received the news that her body had been found, she was just so relieved that they knew where she was finally and that they were going to get her back because the not knowing where she was for those four weeks was just agony for the family. But at least now they could say their goodbyes and they could give Rachel the burial that she deserves. But going back to where we were in the case, so as soon as Rachel's body was found, forensic teams and a pathologist went to the flat to obviously collect evidence and recover Rachel's body so that a post-mortem could be carried out. And in the meantime, Michael Little was taken to the police station and PC Dennison went through the notes that he had taken. He went through the confession and Little agreed that the notes were accurate. He was sticking to his story that he killed Rachel in self-defense. He claimed that she had a knife in her hand. She went to stab him and so he grabbed another bigger knife and attacked her before she could attack him. So now that they had a main suspect, the police started looking a bit more into Michael Little and his background. Michael Little was one of six siblings. He had an older brother and four half-sisters who were all younger than him and in his younger years he was described as being a problem child. He was never well behaved. Apparently he was completely out of control by the time he was just 13. He started committing crime at a young age, he was committing petty theft and in school he was branded a bully. In fact he was excluded from school several times I believe because he was just so troublesome and because he was such a bully towards other kids. When he was 16 he left school without any qualifications and it seems as though he never really had a steady income. Any job he ever had he didn't have for long. He could never hold down a job. Although according to a couple of sources he did claim that he was unable to work because he had depression and because he suffered from headaches and leg ulcers. Michael moved into his flat in Nash Court I believe just months before Rachel death and he spent most of his time just in his flat smoking, drinking and watching pornography. He did have a couple of friends and interestingly when the police spoke to these friends they said that Michael was a fantasist. He used to fantasize about dating women and he even told his friends at one point that he was dating a six foot tall blonde supermodel which turned out to be a lie. He wasn't dating anyone. But when the police heard about this, they began thinking that maybe he had been fantasizing about the woman that would later become his murder victim, Rachel Moran. Rachel and Michael didn't know each other personally. She would have had no idea who he was, but of course they did live quite close to each other and Rachel pretty much matched the description of the girl that he told his friends he was dating. She was very tall she was over six foot and she was blonde so perhaps Michael had been watching Rachel for a while maybe he would watch her walk along the street from his window and he would fantasize about dating her. The police also started looking into what Michael was actually doing on New Year's the night that Rachel disappeared and they found out that that night he had been out with a couple of his friends. He was out drinking and he was hoping to have a good night, a good New Year's celebration. However, he became frustrated and annoyed when one of the girls that he fancied and had been flirting with that night 
actually went off with one of his friends. After this, he went to another party that he was invited to and he stayed at that party until after the midnight countdown. And then not long after midnight, he decided to walk home, walk back to his flat and he would have walked down the same route that Rachel would have walked that night. In fact, it's believed now that he actually witnessed Rachel and her mother talking on their doorstep. Remember, Wanda and Rachel were outside of the house for a little while because Wanda was begging Rachel not to walk back home on her own. And Wanda remembered seeing a stranger, a man, walking past. And at the time, she even thought about asking this man if he could accompany Rachel on her walk home. But she didn't in the end. And it's strongly believed now that that man, that passerby, was Michael Little. He was on his way home that night and he probably heard the two of them talking about how Rachel was going to walk home alone in the dark and so maybe when he heard that he decided that it was the perfect opportunity to strike. So with all of this in mind the police went back to the CCTV footage they had obtained earlier on in the investigation. Remember there were two lots of CCTV footage from that night. The first showed Rachel walking past a supermarket and they knew that that was Rachel that footage was quite clear in comparison to the second lot and when they looked through this footage again they noticed that about three minutes before Rachel walked along this road there was a man walking past and the man on this footage they believed was Michael Little which would make sense if he was that passerby if he walked past Rachel when she was talking to her mother he would have been a couple of minutes ahead of her but then what's interesting is when you look at the second lot of CCTV footage the police had the footage from the nearby school which was taken about 150 meters from Rachel's flat when you look at this footage it appears as though Michael Little is now behind Rachel. As we discussed earlier, this footage really wasn't the best quality. The road that the camera was on wasn't lit and it was the middle of the night. But on this footage, they could see what looked like a woman walking in the direction of Rachel's flat. And so for that reason, they strongly believed that this woman was Rachel. And then also on this footage, they could see a figure walking not too far behind her almost like they were following Rachel so they now believed that this figure was Michael Little but why was he behind Rachel all of a sudden surely he would have been ahead of her well it's theorized that he was now behind her on the second lot of footage because maybe he decided that he was going to attack her this was premeditated and so at some point during his route he must have stopped and hidden somewhere waited for Rachel to walk by and then when she did he began walking behind her so that when he attacked her she wouldn't have known that it was coming because it would have been from behind but of course if this was the case if that was what happened that night then that completely goes against his version of events his story was that he started chatting to Rachel and he invited her back to his flat and she accepted this invite she went back there willingly but at some point he walked into his kitchen where Rachel was holding a knife and she slashed his arm with it so he grabbed another knife and started stabbing her to try and defend himself. However, Rachel's post-mortem results suggested a completely different story. It was found that her cause of death was from stab wounds, but it was determined that she had been stabbed 27 times in the head, neck and back. And these stab wounds were so vicious, they had been inflicted with so much force that many of them actually went all the way through her body. Which does not indicate that he killed Rachel in self-defense because why would he need to stab her that many times? If you are stabbing someone in self-defense, you'd probably stab them a couple of times just to immobilize them. You wouldn't stab them 
27 times and in addition to that the autopsy also concluded that Rachel didn't really have any defensive wounds which didn't make sense because according to Michael there had been a struggle between them so surely if that was the case she would have had some self-defense wounds. The lack of defensive wounds on her suggested to the police that Rachel was caught off guard. Like I said she was probably attacked and grabbed from behind so she didn't really have a chance to defend herself and put up a fight. Also Michael didn't really have any self-defense wounds. There were no cuts or or scars on his arms and yet he claimed that Rachel had attacked him with the knife first and slashed his arm. The evidence that the police had just did not match up with Michael's story. So now I'm going to talk through what the police believe happened that night after looking at all of the evidence. They believed that whilst Michael Little was walking back to his flat he heard Rachel talking to her mother in the early hours of New New Year's Day about how she was going to walk back home because her boyfriend Mark had left their kittens home alone. He knew that she was going to be walking on her own in a vulnerable state so he continued walking for a little while. He was walking a couple of minutes ahead of Rachel until eventually he stopped, hid and waited for her to walk by and then when she did he started walking behind her. And one theory that the police have is that maybe Michael Little being the fantasist that he was, maybe he decided to approach Rachel and try to befriend her and chat her up essentially. Perhaps he did actually try to get her to come to his flat that night but it's very very unlikely that Rachel would have gone with him because well number one she had a boyfriend who she was happy with and number two she didn't know Michael so it's very unlikely that she would have agreed to go to a stranger's flat. Oh and also number three she was determined to get home quickly to be there for the kittens that that night and so the police think that Rachel probably just ignored Michael and she just carried on walking and this would have been the second time he was rejected that night. If you remember he tried to flirt with another girl that he fancied earlier on that evening but she also rejected him and went off with his friend. So it's believed that being rejected a second time probably really angered him and he decided in that moment that he was going to make Rachel go back to his flat with him whether she liked it or not he was going to abduct her and so at some point when she was very close to his home he went up to her from behind grabbed her put his hand over her mouth to stop her from screaming and then they think that he dragged her into his home. Another thing that was found in her autopsy was that Rachel actually had dried mud on the back of her legs so that's why the police think that she was dragged into the flat. They think that he dragged her across some grass and through his front door and that's how the mud got on her and then once they were in the flat Little grabbed a knife and he began stabbing her repeatedly and it's believed that she was killed in the hallway of his home because that's where forensics found traces of her blood. Well that's where most of her blood was anyway but there were also traces in the bin cupboard where she was eventually found. There was blood on the walls near his front door and also on his landing I believe. Little had tried to clean the scene afterwards however scientists still found blood spots and traces of blood and when tested it was found that this blood belonged to Rachel. He then wrapped her body up in a duvet and placed her at the bottom of his bin cupboard stacking bin bags and cardboard boxes on top of her and then he put her belongings in a bin bag and as we know he dumped that bin bag in a canal and then he just carried on with life as normal despite having a dead body in his home and I don't know what his plan was I don't know what he planned to do with Rachel's body was he just going to keep it in his flat with him forever or did he intend on 
disposing of it somehow we don't know now it was later found through tests conducted on swabs taken during rachel's post-mortem that michael little had had sexual intercourse with rachel that night but they couldn't determine whether it was before or after her death that this happened they believe that it was probably after her death but they couldn't be certain and so for that reason the detectives decided not to charge him with rape because even though everyone believes that this was rape no one believes that Rachel willingly had sex with him that night even though everyone believes that it was rape the detectives didn't have solid evidence to prove it so they couldn't charge him with that but they could charge him with murder and that's exactly what they did on the 31st of January 2003 however despite literally confessing to the murder as soon as Rachel's body was found Little actually decided to plead not guilty and he completely changed his original story. His trial began in October of 2003 during which his defence team claimed that actually Michael Little wasn't the killer but he did have sex with Rachel that night. Michael Little's new story was that Rachel's killer was actually Mark Fuller, his friend that was in his flat with him on the day that Rachel's body was found. Now as we know as we discussed earlier Mark Fuller was arrested when Rachel's body was found and he was taken to the police station. However he was never charged with anything and he was eventually released because the police had absolutely no evidence linking him to the crime and they believed that he had no idea that Rachel's body was in a cupboard in Michael Little's flat. Like I said earlier he seemed genuinely as shocked as the officers when the body was found. So Mark was released however during the trial Michael Little and his defence team were basically trying to say that he was the killer not Michael. Michael Little's new story was that on the night of Rachel's death he came home in the early hours of the morning to find that Mark Fuller was already in his flat and a woman was with him and this woman was Rachel Moran. According to Michael, Mark had met Rachel that night because he was going to give her some cannabis and after the exchange, Mark invited Rachel over to his friend Michael's flat. So Michael came home, he found Mark and Rachel in his flat so he sat down with them and all three of them were having a drink and chatting. Little then claimed that at some point he went into his bedroom and Rachel followed him and when they were both in his room she asked him if he thought she was good looking and he replied that she was. He thought that she was quote extremely gorgeous and then he claimed that as soon as he said that Rachel put her arms around his neck and they began kissing. He went on to say that the two of them had consensual unprotected sex and that shortly after this his friend Mark came storming into the room and he was angry. He was furious with Michael for having sex with Rachel because she was his and he was also furious with Rachel. Michael claimed that Mark was just completely out of control. He was so so angry he felt like the two of them had betrayed him in a way and so he went into the kitchen and grabbed a knife and he began stabbing Rachel repeatedly and when she fell to the floor Mark continued stabbing her whilst calling her a bitch and then once Rachel was dead Mark threatened Michael with the knife and he said that if he didn't help him clean up and move the body and if he ever told anyone what he had done he would not only kill him too, but also Michael's entire family. And so Michael did what Mark said. He cleaned up the blood and he wrapped up Rachel's body and placed it in the cupboard. And then he just left it there. That was Michael's new story. But of course, as I'm sure you've probably guessed, no one believed this story. No one even believed his original story where he said that he stabbed Rachel in self-defense. Everyone just believed that Michael Little was 
was a compulsive liar and that this new story was just his desperate attempt to pin the blame on someone else but it didn't work because as I said there was absolutely nothing linking Mark Fuller to the crime. All of the evidence the police had in this case, the CCTV footage, the forensic evidence, a confession, every bit of evidence they had pointed to one man and one man only. Michael Little. And so when the trial came to an end on the 30th of October 2003, he was found guilty of the murder of 21 year old Rachel Moran and he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. And that is it for this case. That is the case of Rachel Moran. Something that I just wanted to mention before I end the video is that Rachel's older sister Vanda has actually passed away. She passed on the 7th of August 2010. Vanda had a lot of health problems which related to her long-term diabetes and she died in hospital from complications following exposure to chickenpox. And the Moran family strongly believe that Michael Little is responsible for Vanda's death too because when Rachel was murdered, Vanda really neglected her treatment because she was of course heartbroken her sister had been viciously killed i imagine she couldn't focus on anything apart from that so her health really started to decline following this i've got a quote here from her father mr moran and he said quote he took away a part of vanda on that new year's morning and started a steady decline in her general health leading to her many operations and hospital stays that full year i put down to michael little without a shadow of a doubt he's killed her he also said quote she fought every adversity with courage and bravery she kept her pride and her dignity and she would not give in to her illness she was kind caring and proud and vanda was buried next to her little sister rachel in a cemetery in hull it's just so heartbreaking that ray and wanda moran lost not just one of their children but two and that carrie and john lost two sisters but I hope that they have some peace of mind in knowing that Rachel and Vanda are buried next to each other and they are together now but yeah that is it for this case um as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments also let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel i do have a case request form linked in the description box so if there is a specific case that you would like to hear from me then definitely check that out because i have a look at my case request form every single week but yeah thank you all so much for watching please Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!